Yeah, welcome, welcome. We're back now with Jerry Heron in, the, in Detroit. Uh, he's the dean of the uh, Honors College there. We're going to talk some in this second hour uh, with him about that because it's a major development. And so, Jerry, it's so good to be back in touch with you for this second hour of uh, programming here in June of 2015. Thank you, Harold. Good, back, good to be back here with you again. Okay, we talked a great deal about Wayne University, about Detroit and so forth. And I want to make it known that you are the dean, and I want you to talk with us a little bit about the structure of the university, pop, uh, student population, size, the schools, and that sort of thing, uh, if you could, uh, because you're the dean of a college, and it's called the, uh, the Irvin, it's the um, Reed, what is it, Irvin, E-R-V-I-N, uh, Reed, R-E-I-D, College of Honors College at Wayne State University. I'm not correct. Is that correct? It is correct. I'm the dean of the Irvin D. Reed Honors College at Wayne State University. We are named proudly after President Emeritus Irvin D. Reed, who was a previous president of Wayne State University. We have 13 schools and colleges okay. at the university, and Honors is among those. There are schools like the School of Medicine, School of Engineering, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, etc. The Honors College, of which I am the dean, yeah. is a relatively recent part of the university. Uh -huh. We have become a college only since, well, we became a college only in 2008. The decision was made by President Reed at the time when he was president of the university mm -hmm. that the relatively modest program we had in Honors needed to grow. And its reason for growing was to make a home to students of ambition in all kinds of fields, not just one particular major or kind of majors, and not one particular kind of preparation. But we wanted to make a home on the campus for students with high ambitions and students who wanted to ask the most of themselves and get the best out of a great urban research university. And that was my job assignment when it came to turning our program into a college. That's very interesting. It's a phenomenon that exists in the university structure. Uh, has it been there all along from, uh, you know, the uh, early days of Princeton? And so has there been a, the concept of an honors college? Is that something that's spreading widely? Has it been part of the educational pattern all along? It's, we used to have Phi Beta Kappa and so forth. But I'm just trying to say, where does it fit in in terms of the evolution of university educational patterns and uh, programs? Well, honors education in America really gets going in the 1950s. Oh, I see. Okay. 60s. So it's a relatively recent event where schools and colleges, very much like the one where I work at Wayne yeah. State University, decided we want to figure out what it means to be in honors at our campus. Now, it means a, a variety of different things. Yes. It's on the kind of institution we're talking about. Schools have their smallest faith-based institutions that have honors programs or colleges. There are liberal arts, traditional liberal arts schools that have honors programs or colleges. There are large state-supported research institutions like Wayne State University that have programs and colleges. The idea, I think, is not that there is one definition of honors that fits this whole range of different projects. Uh -huh. it, not each institution is, it has this question presented to itself, or it creatively presents itself with this question, what does honors education mean here, based uh -huh. on the assets we have, the kind of aspirations we have, the things we would like to do for our students to represent the best possible education to those students and to offer them the greatest challenges to themselves as their students here. So, as I said, it can mean a whole variety of things. Uh, and honors education today uh -huh. is very much an area where growth is going on. Okay. Schools and colleges are saying, yes, we would like to take part in that honors mission. That's very interesting in itself. I hear you say uh, Irving uh, is named after the president. I've looked him up. He's an interesting fellow. He was the president. He was a black man for, the, I think, the first time at Wayne University, which was very apropos of the time. And he was very, very, uh, uh, very vo uh, involved with the business community and very active and did a great deal in terms of building the university up uh, in terms of uh, plant and equipment and buildings and so forth. He was a very uh, active uh, president who got a great deal done. 
Yes, in, in fact, tenure. the building where mm -hmm. I'm talking to you from, uh, mm -hmm. this is the undergraduate library, and the Honors College is located on the second floor of this library, mm -hmm. um, the middle of our campus, um, and that's where the camp, that's where the library is. We also have a fitness center. We have housing. Um, this whole central section of the campus was undertaken as part of the construction projects that Dr. Reed, then President Irvin D. Reed, undertook to. Uh -huh create this sense of community inside the great university, uh, to especially in my case, to build a home for undergraduate students where they could study in the library and also live on our campus. Okay, that's interesting. I heard you say it came in, uh, uh, in the 50s or 60s that this became, we're, we're, uh, we, we used to have fraternity, we, we had, you know, uh, honor societies like Phi Beta Kappa, things like that and everything. But this is something new structurally to education that they would have a college, an honors program. Is it a, an accelerated? Is it a thing that is challenging or people that are really serious? Or what, 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 what caused it to, were there founding fathers or mothers of that concept at a university level across the country? Or how did it come into being where it hadn't been earlier or what was the impetus for it to be created as a concept in education well interesting you should ask me and this does sound directly like a kind of political plug which i'm about to make good There's you. A national organization called the national collegiate honors council and okay. it's a body to which the directors and the deans of honors programs and colleges to staff members faculty members students are members of this organization and mm. i am the president-elect, a uh, year from now, I'll be president of the organization. Congratulations. I thank you. Thank oh. you kindly. Uh -huh. um, and our organization is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Oh, so I see. Okay. That gives you some idea as to the span when honors education really began to take off in it the United States. Uh, there were honors projects that predate the existence of our organization, uh -huh. but the organization's creation 50 years ago it coincides with this greater interest nationally in <laughs> education. Now, what that means, I think, as I was suggesting, is that each institution defines for itself what do we think would best honor the goals and values of the institution, best honor our vision, and challenge our students. And it can mean a variety of different things. But among those, I think, are what have become so-called high-impact practices, things that we know in college education we know that these things will have positive benefits to students in terms of their experience, the quality of that experience, uh, their success as students. Uh -huh. Things such as undergraduate research, experiential learning, where you go out into the world like Ralph Waldo Emerson would have encouraged people to do in the yes. American Scholar, and you yes. do things yes. with uh, Doing things <laughs> in capstone projects, uh, doing things in service learning, where you take classroom education and you turn that into something of value for a community partner. This whole range of activities, these high impact practices, are characteristic of honors education and have been since the beginning. Uh, is, is it associated with any particular individual or any particular school? Or, I mean, it's, it sounds very interesting. I'm very interested in the, the concept and the, you know, are there historical roots for it? Uh, or people who self-selected to take a advanced course, they have a, the Center of Advanced Studies at Princeton or something along those lines, or you say 50 years ago, 1950 or so. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious in it because I haven't been involved in the university for a long time and I, it's something that I hadn't been aware of and yet I see that it's very, very much part of the educational pattern now and a very important institution. I'm just trying to understand its nascent, you know, where it came from and what was the impetus for it and implications and more or less what's the future of uh, this honors concept that's being introduced into institutions of higher learning. I would say its origins in the very briefest terms could probably be described as wanting to make available to students at a wide variety of institutional settings, yeah. to make available to them the kind of special experience that students at historically elite institutions might have received. Wow, so that, okay, like the prep schools or something. Or, or, like or prep, prep schools, schools and like universities. Yeah. Small, um, the, yeah. the traditional 
excellent liberal arts schools on the east coast of the United States, by yeah. and large. So uh -huh. that if you're at a school such as mine, Wayne State University, and you said, mm -hmm. well, what is it that the students at an elite, outstanding, small institution, what is it that they get? Yeah. Makes that institution special. They get special classes. They get to do things in the world, these experiential learning experiences. Yeah. They capstone writing projects. They mm. do this range of things, these high impact practices as they're called. Uh -huh. Let's make those available to a wider audience in a wider variety of settings. Wonderful. So that can take Wonderful. the very best things we know how to do yeah. as college educators uh -huh. and make those available to the students at the institutions where we work. That's basically the project. That's a good I, that's a good project. idea I would submit to spread that out because you get good you get good results from that in terms of the educational development of our intellectual and, and socially responsible citizenry. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think citizenship and responsibility are central, uh, yeah. certainly to this notion of honors education, uh -huh. as we want to train the next generation of leaders. And we also want to train not just traditional college freshmen, their honors projects at community colleges, their honors projects that involve returning adults who are in the middle of a career. Uh, we think that these good things that we know how to do should be available to as wide an audience as possible. So that, that what's that association called again, the one that uh, oversees that? that you've become the, you're the president-elect, congratulations on that, and you'll be the president uh, of it in the upcoming year, is that what I understood? I will indeed, and I uh, thank you for asking. It's the National Collegiate Honors Council, NCHC, as it's often called, and we have a fine website where you can gain access to a bunch of really good information about our organization and our next national meeting, which will be taking place in November in Chicago to celebrate our 50th birthday. So I would encourage everybody to just Google NCHC Honors and it'll take you right to us. Could, could you say that again? Because I think I have at the, at the conclusion of this program a website that's rather more lengthy than that that gets to the Honors College. But could you say that again here now then what it is? NCHC is the, those are the initials, it's uh -huh. the National Collegiate Honors Council. Uh -huh. And I think if you just Google NCHC Honors, it'll get you right there. Okay, that's good, because uh, that, that's really good. I, that sounds like a very, very good uh, idea to me, and I congratulate you on assuming the presidency of that upcoming. And uh, do, do they have uh, standards or do they have best practices and that sort of thing? I suppose they do. Is, could anybody do that or do they have to meet certain standards in order to be able to start a, a program like that? What is the advantage of having a program like that as part of the curriculum of a university in terms of student attraction or reputation or outcome educationally or otherwise, if I may? In your in your experience, or your, you know, in your in terms of you surveying the implications of the existence of this new uh, pattern to education at a higher level. Well, you would find on our website uh, uh -huh. for National Collegiate Honors Council some ideas about what would define a fully developed honors program, what would define a fully developed honors college, and you can find a, a list of the kinds of things in terms of academic structure, the kinds of things in terms of resources, the sorts of things in terms of experiences we offer to students that would define each one of those academic organizations, whether a program or a fully developed honors college, and they are really organized around these notions of five impact, of high impact practices. Okay. That's First-year seminars and experiences, common intellectual experiences, the building of learning communities, uh, use, uh, writing intensive courses, collaborative assignments that get students working together, um, undergraduate research, which is a very important one, especially yes. for yes. an institution such as mine, where this is a research university, very high activity in the yeah. Carnegie Foundation ratings. Yeah. We want to be sure that undergraduate students such as the ones in my college, many of them undergraduate students mm -hmm. uh, coming to college as freshmen in the 18 to 24 year old range. Yeah. We to make sure that they don't have to wait to be involved in the research mission of the university, that they get to come into that mission immediately and become part of it through their whole experience here from freshman year through capstone experiences, through internships that they might undertake, which are also elements of these high impact practices. That was very good. You're talking about how it sets the standards for, uh, for a high, uh, uh, you know, for, for, a, for an institution or a university. But those standards that came trippingly and beautifully, poetically off the, 
the uh, your tongue, as it were, uh, would be characteristics of a very, very responsible citizenry, Indeed, as well as I the institution. You're creating a really responsible and maximally engaged and cooperative and contributing citizenry, which is the mark of uh, education writ large, is it not? I could not agree more, and mm. that is certainly one of the primary goals of us at the Urban D. Reed Honors College. We want to be sure that we're creating informed, engaged citizens who are informed as to the responsibilities and the privileges and the wealth of opportunity in our republic and engaged with doing things in this world based oh. on college education that they receive here. And is this, this is widespread across the country. Is it widespread, the concept, let's say the concept, uh, is, is it wide, is it characteristic of educational institutions worldwide? Does it have uh, characteristics that are close in other aspects of the, the inns at Cambridge or something that is uh, doing the same kind of thing historically, I, 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 or what? Or is it, is it, al courant is the term in the mo modern language of, of education worldwide now, do you think? Or ought it be, or could it be, or what do you think? Well, I think you would certainly find in higher education in the United States mm -hmm. that honors education is very much a, a growth area. That mm -hmm. is, it's a place where schools and colleges are building honors programs, they're building honors colleges in order to accomplish a couple of things. Yes. One of, certainly is to create the best possible experience for a group of students uh, through these high impact practices and the characteristics of a fully developed program or college. And the second one is to have a kind of marquee uh, to take the very best things that a particular institution considers to be its hallmarks, to be its proudest achievements, uh -huh. and to build a marquee to showcase those both internally and also externally, uh -huh. to showcase to the institution itself the great things we're capable of doing so that everyone is aware, to showcase to potential students and their parents and families what's possible at a great institution as it thinks about its own strengths, uh -huh. and then also to showcase those nationally and internationally as a kind of workshop to say these are some ways to do things and we think very effectively so that we hope that those ways of doing things will proliferate and it turns out that honors education is not only a movement growing across the united states increasingly since the 1950s uh -huh. uh, when our organization came into being yes. uh, it's also now an international project okay. uh, it's something that you can find in other countries uh -huh. A modeled upon the United States. It, it came, it's a, it's, it's pedigree is the United States, uh, more or less? I don't know that we would say, I suppose, some of the folks that those, as you refer to them, those ancient universities like yeah. Oxford, Cambridge, would like to think that they were in on honors education a bit before we even Well, they, 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 were, they were educating the gentry, you know, the people that had those kind of advantages, but you're going to spread that out democratically to greater numbers of people, those marks of good civil, uh, good contribution to the improvement of the society. Correct, uh, exactly. I, so that I think, again, honor. the of opportunities and honors is as various as the range of institutions where we want to undertake this project, okay. but it has the common characteristic of wanting to do the very best job possible for our students and to engage those students with the world. And be do doing it for not only just the, uh, the gilded few in the castles of feudal Europe or something, but for the vast majority of people, uh, citizenry that can begin to become, uh, make contributions in a democratic way. It seems to me that's the mark of the, the modern era. I wonder if I could ask something. Honors, like you, you mentioned, they have different schools. You have medical, you have uh, engineering, you have curriculum, you have things that have traditionally been done in order to obtain a certain degree. Do, could you have an, uh, you could have a, let's say you have an engineering college or or a medical school. Wayne happens to be very well regarded in terms of its medical school, if I'm not mistaken and everything. But you have certain things you have to learn and part of the discipline of that particular thing you're studying. But do they then have within that an honors prospect that offers something a little more even than the core curriculum that's intent, that's part of each of the various schools, if you can understand what I'm saying. Is it an addendum or is it an alternate way of dealing with the, with the body of human knowledge that is the stuff of uh, concern at universities? 
I would say it's the second of those two. Uh -huh. So, for example, a student in the Irvin D. Reed Honors College can major in any of the, I believe it's over 120 different undergraduate majors that are available uh -huh. to students in Wayne yeah. State. So wow. you can yeah. choose any of those yeah. and study those as part of the Honors College. Mm -hmm. Engineering, biochemistry, chemistry, physics, whatever the field of inquiry that you're interested in. Uh -huh. What happens then is that as an Honors College student, 36 of the credit hours that you would take for your degree, a degree typically taking 120 or so credit hours over okay. the students' years of study, uh -huh. 36 of those credit hours would be honors versions of things that students are going to do anyway. Uh -huh. So we think that we can offer alternatives for students who want to challenge themselves, students who want to gain access to the very, we feel, the very best kinds of experiences the university has to offer. Uh -huh. Students would take an honors version of the coursework that would lead to the major, whatever their major yeah, that they decide right. to pursue. Uh -huh. They also may pursue special honors in those majors. Uh -huh. So university honors is a general credential to show that a student has undertaken a very, uh, we think, rigorous, rewarding, and engaged curriculum from freshman to senior year. And a student might also want to distinguish himself or herself in the particular major that that student has taken, chemistry, biology, mm -hmm. physics, yeah. whatever. Yeah, that's interesting. And, 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 and the students who's, who opt to, uh, to, to add the honors aspect to their educational process are self-selected. They select that themselves. We recruit students into the Honors College, but we also are happy to have students join us who decide that they would like to undertake an honors experience uh, as they learn more about us along the way. So we okay. have folks who come into the Honors College as freshmen. We have students who transfer into the Honors College from other institutions or uh -huh. students from our institution uh -huh. who join us in progress. Typically, those latter two groups would pursue honors in a particular major as opposed to university honors, which is usually something that our students pursue from freshman year forward. I see, okay. And we have the arts and sciences as sort of a grounding thing, the baccalaureate and all that sort of thing. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about it uh, with the, uh, the audience and so forth. Um, the course of education now, um, we used to have uh, liberal arts or Somebody once said, uh, I forget who it was, I don't know, it might have been Bucky Fuller or somebody said, there ought to be a department of, uh, uh, in the university or in, the, in the, the attitude of people toward education, there ought to be a department of everything. <laughs> you know, because everything is interconnected. We know right. that now from the physics of the universe to the biology to the political thing, everything is connected, you understand? It's really one big system that we're all part of, including the ecology and the physics and so forth. But we do, we do uh, tend to specialize, and it, some people say reductionism, into very highly specialized context of what we call education by making it very, very specialized and what about, is there room or is the honors program a way in which people who are being encouraged to become highly specialized on one prospect, one part of quantum mechanics or something or some special thing uh, could be getting at a systems understanding where you're recognizing patterns between an area of specialization of knowledge. If you understand what I mean, is there a place in the university for large systems thinking, pattern recognizing, uh, integrating of great numbers of different things, and is the honors program maybe something that moves along or encourages systems thinking rather than the high specialization that seems to be characteristic of a great deal of educational development and the trend thereof within the United States and the world? Well, I think you've just described one of the great challenges of modern life in yeah. general. Mm. and certain university education in particular, which yeah. is specialization and integration. Yeah. So certainly we want students that we prepare in a particular major to be as well prepared as possible at a research institution, which yeah. would mean preparing themselves in the very most current state of the knowledge mm. in that particular field, whatever yeah. that happens to be. Uh -huh. At the same time, as the citizens of this republic, it's mm. important to be able, as you're suggesting, to do a little systems thinking and say, how do these pieces fit together? Right. So students at every 
college and universities take a general education curriculum, a, a variety of a number of different courses, the hope behind which is that students will become generally acquainted with knowledge in a variety of fields, oh. the arts, the humanities, the sciences, the physical sciences, biological sciences. Oh. And I think the hard part then is everybody takes a general education curriculum of some kind. Oh. Everybody pursues a major with specialist knowledge in their field. The difficult part and the challenging part, and I think this is where honors education does have a lively and in important role to play. Uh -huh. The difficult and challenging part is to begin to put those pieces together. Yeah. So if you know Bloom's taxonomy, for example, where yeah. people and by learning things and knowing things, understanding things, creative response to knowledge is up there at the very top of uh -huh. that taxonomy to uh -huh. be able to take what's known and then be able to invent ideas. Uh -huh. That's what we hope to encourage through the four-year curriculum that our students undertake which is based on the four pillars of their experience, community, service, research, and career. Community, service, research, and career. Correct. Yeah, we okay, yeah, huh? Uh -huh. Those define, relatively speaking, the emphasis of each of the four years that an undergraduate might spend in a college or university, but they also are things we want to be going on concurrently. Right. As we want students to feel themselves part of a community and join a community. Absolutely, marks of citizenship, right? Correct. They should uh, be generally recognized by a gentleman or a lady. Uh, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's part of leadership and part of the qualities one would want to inculcate with educational uh, training. Huh? Precisely. Yeah. And as members of a community, as a student moves through a curriculum, working toward a senior thesis, junior, senior seminars, that's where we want to begin to put back together the kind of study that a student might begin at the, at, the outset of a, at the outset of a student's career. They might be taking a wide range of general education courses. Then they focus on a major and become concentrated in a particular field. Uh -huh. We want to make sure that students are invited toward the conclusion of their undergraduate experience to begin contemplating how those pieces fit together. Systems thinking is what you proposed, yes. How to see how the pieces of the design of all of these different branches of knowledge, how they fit together to provoke good questions, to provoke creative thinking, synthetic thinking that puts pieces together and prepares citizens of this republic for the challenge it will, challenges that will doubtless lie ahead of us. You, you don't think, you, you think that there are opportunities, we, we have liberal arts, people take liberal arts courses, uh, you know, ju um, freshman, junior or something, and then they get into specialization. Uh, you don't think it's overly specialized, the tendency the reward system, the career opportunities that specialization affords. Uh, Harold? Will, yes, I'm here. Uh, are we out of touch? Hello? Hello? What's happened? Hello? Oh, apparently we've lost... Her. I'm talking, but what's happened? Can you hear me, Jerry? Have we lost the contact? We're on. Can you hear me, Jerry? I can't hear you. What's happened? Can you get uh, Roberto or something, or what are we going to do? I'm talking, but um, I don't know what's going on. What's happened? Hello? That's very discouraging that we seem to have lost it. Hello, hello? Harold, can you hear me? Yeah, I do now. We seem to, what happened? Uh, can I be given some, were you able to hear or did we lose touch there for a while? Hello? Now I don't hear him. Now, hello? Hello? This is a little bit uh, strange. I don't know what's going on. Rose, uh, yeah, but okay. What's I don't know. Well, I'm I'm going to be talking. I don't know if it's recording or not. Maybe I'm talking to Jerry Heron in New York. We're having trouble with the Skype connection for some reason. We're in the middle of a thing, and they're trying to get it going. And I don't know if I, my voice is being recorded or not. But I could keep talking. He's a wonderful guy, and we're talking about the honors programs, and they're apparently having difficulty with the Skype uh, connection with him, he's in Detroit at Wayne State University. We're talking about the honors programs 
and we seem yeah. to have lost the connect. There's a little clip. Hello. You back? Uh, now we're back. Okay. It looked like we had a little trouble, but I now I see you, but I can't hear you. Could we be talking? Uh, is there anything recording? What's the story? Um, we, there I, we, now everything looks like it's okay on my end. Well, now maybe it's working. Now maybe it's working. Okay. Well, I I may Jerry. I'm not sure what's going to be the outcome, but we may have uh, just had a break in the thing. I kept talking, so maybe it can record. So we're talking about the honors program, and I just had said a very profound thing. I thought, and then they got cut off. But anyway, we're talking about the honors program. And now, can you hear me now, Jerry? I can. Can you okay, hear me? Okay, so maybe we can get. So what I'm getting at really in the question I had, and if it, it maybe it can still work, we can just say to the audience, sorry about that interruption and continue. But whether or not the uh, the highly specialized thing that, that the market favors highly specialized, uh, uh, the market in general for society or the encouragement is to get what would be reduction highly specialized in a particular field and not make possible systems thinking which have been the tradition of the educated person i'm just wondering if that's a trend that we can see and if your honors program might be moving in the direction that could allow a place for systems thinking pattern recognizing in uh, what's his name um Werner, no, no, um, uh, that people recognize that uh, information overload is coming exponential now. The information technology is morphing into robotics and it's coming every day, Jerry, comes over the transom, a, a new revolution in every field and it's coming in such a dimension. And it was um, people who were familiar with that they said that information over, you, you have an information overload and information overload permits pattern recognition. It permits pattern recognition between a lot of other sub parts of a system. And I'm just wondering if it doesn't offer the possibility for people to begin to see things in a very comprehensive way that hasn't been possible to us historically. And if it wouldn't be able for people to understand things um, that are very seemingly complex, but in a pattern way that could be generally of interest to the general population of the world to understand the complexities of the actual reality that's transpiring in our, in our, in our lifetime. I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. The educational thing could be expanded to great numbers of people with understanding that just has not been available to people uh, historically. I, I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can understand what I'm saying. Sure, and I think on behalf of specialization, you know, if one takes scientific research yes. at a cellular level, let's say, uh -huh. it's possible now in this modern era to solve problems relative to disease and different kinds of health conditions that people even 20 or 30 or 40 years ago would never have dreamed possible. Mm -hmm. We didn't know you could do those kinds of things, and we've all benefited by the highly specialist knowledge. True. And the same is true, I think, of communications technologies, the kinds of things that are bound up in the cell phone that I yeah. have in my pocket. Yes. You have to be very good at a specialist knowledge to be able to come up with the technologies that build those, or the automobile that I drive, same yeah. thing. Yeah. Much complicated than that simple Volkswagen that I used to drive around when I was an undergraduate. Yeah. And I feel myself the beneficiary of the products of highly specialized knowledge and yeah. wouldn't want to do without the benefits of modern medicine, the right. benefits of technology. Right. At the same time, I think, one of the things that we encounter is being able to manipulate life, let's say, at a cellular level, being able to intervene, begins to raise questions that are good questions to raise. So all of a sudden, we can operate at a cellular level and do things in terms of modifying genetic codes. I think it's one of the glories of education a general education to have at our disposal philosophers who might mm -hmm. say, now that's an interesting question. We could do those things. Should we do those things? Mm -hmm. So it becomes a philosophical inquiry. And then we have artists and humanists of a whole range who say, for example, like when we first encountered the city, 
and you get a film like Metropolis. Yes, to, is this wonderful. Question, yes, is the city really a good thing? Is uh -huh. the city mass phenomenon? This is from the 1920s. Yes, People sir. are raising this question in the arts that is very much a demographic question. It's a historical question. It's a cultural question. But I think the arts can often render a question thinkable and imaginable by a great number of people through a medium such as film, a film like Metropolis, for example, where yeah. you can begin to think about problems that might grow out of highly specialist knowledge, but then become all of our problems because the specialist knowledge will be deployed across the society. Uh -huh. Blade Runner is another example. The what? I'm sorry? The what? I said Blade, the film Blade Runner. Is another Blade example. Runner, yeah, Are right, we... yeah. Metropolis was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. But, but I think there is, yeah. a, is an instance where the arts, the humanities, come to the service of science and technology to say, let's think about what this means, not just what can we do, not just what is it cap what are we capable of inventing, but what does that invention mean and how are we to interpret it? Right, right. And these are called for, uh, uh, Dr. Strangelove was an interesting movie, too. Because uh, one of the aspects of human consciousness is we can extend our consciousness in tools and technology and make the world other than in an Eden-like sense is the lot of most creatures in the evolutionary process. And realpolitik has been ruling in terms of the development of uh, civilizations since the Neolithic. And that's usually whoever had the strongest army could conquer and set up a political legitimate system with soldiers to support it and so forth. And now the weapon systems, according to modeling, uh, since uh, Mr. Einstein and Mr. Garwin, he designed the thermonuclear weapons, the weapons have apparently from, that exist, that was the basis of realpolitik, you know, uh, have become species lethal, according to modeling. Now, Indeed, that's an existential new reality in universe, if you understand what I'm saying. We have and the I, ability to stop the evolutionary process of which we are at the ascendancy of, if you understand. It must have consequences in terms of, or maybe some adverse side to that in terms of a liberating capability for the human society that has been equally difficult for the vast majority of humanity struggling in a very scarce environment that didn't have nearly enough and had at the peening the rain of its thinking is zero sum. For one to win, somebody else had to lose. We may be actually coming to a time where everybody and a democratic system can actually be operative for the whole of the human society and the ecology equally significant. And there ought to be a place where that can be brought up within the can, within the environment, the, the intellectual environment, that existential reality that is the current situation is what I'm getting at in a certain sense. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what yes, I was getting I think, at. Where, you, where are they thinking the big prob, the big questions comprehensively rather than the specialized reductionist parts of that is what I'm getting at. The honors program might be something where that kind of thing can be or people who are thinking that way could find solace or a place to uh, begin to discuss some of the issues even at a policy level and so forth. I don't know, I'm just rambling a little bit here, but. Well, it's, it's apropos something that we are introducing in our curriculum, which is an electronic portfolio. Okay. And it's, it's literally an electronic repository where students from beginning through their senior year will put their projects. But it's also, and I think more importantly, it's a place where we're going to ask students to be reflective about the goals that we set out with the experience that defines honors education at my institution. Uh -huh. We're going to ask students to be reflective about that experience as they move from freshman to senior year uh -huh. and to think particularly as they draw to the conclusion of yeah. their undergraduate experience to do just what you're suggesting, to think creatively about evaluating their experience and evaluating the pieces as they fit together, not just what they know, but to how the pieces of knowledge fit one into the other. And a great example of that, yeah. I think, that we could point to, uh -huh. to the Rivera murals that exist here yes. at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh -huh. Nico Rivera in the 1930s, 1932, wanted to understand what Detroit industry meant. So he's got an assembly line, and mm -hmm. it's a very particular defined 
representation of industrial work uh -huh. as it would have existed in the early 1930s. But he's also placed that in the context of global forces. He's placed it in the context of geological forces. He placed it in the context of politics Good. through the 36 representation or the, yeah. through the representations that take place as part of the Rivera murals. And you see that this is a man who's attempting to put on the walls of a great museum exactly this problem of system thinking. How yes. does a particular act, a man's working at a machine, putting a car together, yeah. how does that particular act then fit into these larger, even cosmic forces? And yeah. I think that's the question that the creative arts have often helped us through, philosophy, yeah. music, yeah. paint. And that might be the realm of uh, your, uh, that might be one of the outcomes, particularly with this democratic notion of it, uh, of these honors programs that seem to me very much to be encouraged in terms of the educational system within the United States and the world. Quite right. Yeah. I think that's one of I the congratulate you on that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, mm. That's one of the points of emphasis is to emphasize a capstone experience for our students. Uh -huh. When you get to the conclusion of your undergraduate career, to have an experience that brings the pieces back together, uh -huh. to invites a kind of, that invites a kind of contemplation where you're not just in class with uh, chemistry majors, if you're a chemistry major or all biology majors, but where you're in class with a range of different peoples from across the different knowledges that are available, thinking together about how to put the pieces to, of knowledge together and evaluate them, and then to create something based on your evaluation. That, that's a great challenge confronting mankind, I would submit. I think it's a problem that we all of us need to solve. Yeah, we, yeah, we've probably been there for a long time. Listen, Jerry, that, I, I didn't mean to get off. But I congratulate you on being uh, president of that institution and the development within the education. I think we have a couple of little clips, if we can, in the booth. We had a little trouble with the program before, but we have a couple of clips that have to do with honors, if I'm not mistaken. And so, uh, Jocelyn, maybe you could run that first clip for uh, if we can get it going. Here we go. Wednesday Honors. I chose Wednesday Honors. Wednesday Honors. Wednesday Honors because of the opportunities they offer. He gave me access to the resources that wouldn't have been available to me anywhere else. They have a very friendly and approachable administrative staff. Service on demand. Within the first week of coming here, faculty and people in the Honors College already knew my name. I chose Wednesday Honors because of the community of scholars that you can surround yourself by and for all the network that you can create around yourself here at Wednesday. They provide an inviting, close-knit community with a multitude of learning opportunities. There are many different types of scholarships available to us. For tuition, research, and study abroad. I can make a difference in the local community. Because of the great extracurricular activities. And because of the great leadership opportunities. The study abroad opportunities. Wayne State is the place to be. Midtown is the place to be. That's where everything is happening. That is the heart of the city. Wayne State is in the heart of Detroit. And the honors program here really encourages you to learn about the culture. I chose Wayne State Honors because of the diversity in its food, culture, and people. We can get food anytime, any kind, and anywhere. There's so much to do downtown. Like ice skating in campus marshes in the winter, going to Comerica Park, going to the football box theater. I love Detroit. I chose Wayne State Honors because I met the best friends of my life here. Okay, well, that's good. I think that's a good thing. Congratulations on having put that together, uh, re, you know, the re, the, uh, that, that thing. Congratulations on that. I think that's an important development. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm very proud of all of the good things that our young people, our faculty, and our staff have been able to achieve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, then, and, th and then you have meetings with the people who are in this realm of honors uh, at the university level. You, have a con you said you have a conference coming up, so you get together. So people who are in that way of thinking in a certain sense, which would involve, there probably be some people taking advantage of something of opportunity or something, but there'd also be people who are really thinking about the larger issues and role 
of education in a serious way who could get together with fellows and help put something together that could help in in the overall uh, the overall evolution of our society is what I'm sort of in sense. You have an awful lot of good people you'd be associating with. It would seem to me. Oh, we do indeed. Uh -huh. And I would say I would like to emphasize the fact that the National Collegiate Honors Council includes deans and directors. It includes administrative personnel and teachers. Uh, we welcome anybody who would like to join our meetings. Um, we would be. Happy to have you, especially at the 50th anniversary meeting we'll be having in Chicago in November of 2015. Yeah. Because what we would like to do is to make visible and available and understandable this notion of honors education, yeah. the kinds of things that we know to be productive and beneficial. Uh, and I think that sharing of best practices, that sharing of techniques, ways of raising questions, that's really what our organization is all about for yeah. students, for honors professionals, for faculty members, for administrators such as I am, uh, it's to get together and to talk about integrating knowledge and to preparing our students to be the best citizens possible. And I think that's what the movement in honors education has been doing since it first appeared in this country in the 1920s, uh -huh. moved on to the 19, by the 1930s, there were 100 honors programs in the okay. U.S. Oh, I Things see. took off in honors education though, in the 1950s. Yeah, in yeah. The era when the United States, we had the, the GI Bill had brought a lot of new students back into the university, and sure. there was a lot of growth in uh -huh. universities across the country and colleges, and that's when honors education, and that's when our organization really has its first beginnings in the 50s, and then it became an organization in 1966. Oh, it goes back to the 20s and so forth, so there's roots to it and everything, and I think that's encouraging. I, I'm very happy you're involved in that. Uh, we're running a little short of time. We had a little trouble. I think we're going to air this, even if it was just uh, we had a little problem. But uh, I think we have one more clip. We could maybe fit it in. We're coming close to the end of the hour. But we're stressing this thing about honors and the thing that you're involved with, the aspect of it. And that's one of the colleges. So there's now 13 colleges at Wayne State University. Is that correct? City is more than 13 than schools and colleges. Correct. Okay. It's an institution Let's run the clip. And dreams. Always has been always will be. Welcome to the community of scholars. It's a place for the willing to gain the knowledge they seek and the skills they need to succeed. Wayne State's undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs have consistently educated leaders in their fields. I feel that Wayne State will give you a strong education no matter which program you choose. I've been able to choose what I major in. I've been able to take many other classes. I specifically like ethics within philosophy. I'm Good. I'm planning on doing a dual major in biology and economics. Anthropology. Biology. Global supply chain management. Mechanical engineering. Medicine is my future. The Irvin D. Reed Honors College at Wayne State University represents the very best the university has to offer. The people that are here at Wayne State come from such broad backgrounds. You have people from seemingly every country of the world. And the Honors College provides this small home kind of sense of feel. And that personalized attention. And they really made me feel welcome. They made me feel like a person instead of just another number. If I were to describe it briefly, um, I would use the adjectives um, inspiring, motivational, resourceful, competitive, yet friendly. The Irvin D. Reed Honors College is a city-based, service-oriented community that promotes academic excellence while challenging students to engage in the world around them as problem solvers and leaders. We take a direct part in bettering um, the environment that we live in. Detroit is one of those cities that you go to and the city doesn't define who you are, you kind of define what you want out of the city. Um, I've interacted with so many different kinds of individuals and I've just gained um, so much diverse knowledge and experiences that it'll help me in the future. Four pillars define the undergraduate experience for members of the Honors College. Honors is really centered upon the four pillars, which I'm sure everybody knows, um, community research, career and service. In year one, students focus on community and urban experience, where you'll enroll in a two-part signature course, the city and citizenship. I commuted from the suburbs, and I really didn't know what Detroit had to offer in the sense of the arts. Our college town is the city of Detroit. The city really offers a lot to anybody that's willing to take it up on that. Take a chance to learn a little piece about Detroit that you would have never known. All members of the Honors College are being prepared for the real world. Year two focuses on service learning, which takes the skills you've cultivated in the classroom and puts them to use in real world situations. 
through volunteering, research, shadowing, all of these components really help to shape you and prepare you for the best possible education that you can get. I've been able to volunteer, meet doctors, and really learn what it means to be a practicing physician. I was able to go to China um, and teach English for a summer and the university paid for it. I didn't have to spend a dime. Yeah, it just giving us a lot of opportunities to uh, grow and to explore the career that you want to go into. In year three, you are encouraged to develop individual funded research projects. This hands-on research experience provides important preparation for graduate school as well as professional opportunities. So doing research through honors at an undergraduate level really helps you understand where this vast amount of knowledge came from. And I've gotten hands-on experiences that not many other students would be able to have. You begin to understand what it takes to, you know, not only be in class, but to serve as a leader. It's excited me so much that I'm taking it into my own hands. And as a college, as an undergraduate student, I'm now writing my own research projects and proposals. You concentrate your efforts in year four by completing a senior thesis. The thesis is a summing up of your academic achievements, the next step in your career path. Um, because it is career based, it is career focused, and that way I can reach my career goal um, in a straightforward path. At Wayne State, you not only get to meet the faculty, but you get to develop relationships with them. I've learned how to interact with other individuals in the research setting. You have proven yourself that you are willing to work hard and to finish a very difficult degree, and that speaks for itself. Each day, the Wayne State campus fills with students who represent a marvelous diversity. The dedication to creating positive change in the lives of students from all walks of life remains our driving force. It's what we've always done and what we can do for you. And it can be summed up in two simple yet eternally optimistic words. Aim higher. Ah, uh, oh, we're back to the aim higher thing. That's beautiful. I also like, I like uh, 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 Jerry, the, uh, the thing about service, right? It's not only just uh, for the elite kind of uh, thing, but it, it, it's service to our fellow people. May, a li, it was a little redolent of uh, some of the optimism and, and, and idealism of the Peace Corps. Uh, it made me think of that, you know, back to an earlier time. But I think it's really a good development, and I'm, I'm congratulating you and your colleagues that are pursuing that in the educational process. I thank you for that. And yeah. we certainly believe that there's no finer way to make a classroom experience rich than to take the things that you learn in class and to carry them out into the world outside the university. Amen. Yes. But, uh -huh. no. And then to bring that experience back directly into the classroom. Yeah. So that both, both ends of that continuum are winners. The community partner where the service is performed and the classroom where a student has now been able to take knowledge directly into the world and do good with that knowledge. I think that's a model of what we hope an engaged university will accomplish. Yeah, and that's a challenge is before it's before the the world in a very real sense. I, I, I can't help getting over this thing. I, I, I think this is an incredibly challenging time that we live in because things are moving so quickly and it's almost like a, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a period of qualitative transformation, it would seem to me. I don't know if you sense that as well, but the educational process, we're, we're here in uh, public access in, in television, and it seems to me the television medium could be very helpful in terms of having patterns to educate the population, particularly if you're thinking about the broad population. We could, we, you and I were able to, you know, put out a couple movies we knew about that was very, from the multimedia context, but James Joyce and Marshall McLuhan talking about the medium and so forth. We're, we're going, we're, 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 the Gutenberg Galaxy was a tour de force. We're moving into a multimedia electronic world very rapidly. So uh, electronic means of uh, education could be important. That's why I think television and and the internet and so forth is really very important as an educational medium as well. And it blends in well with your honors program, it seems to me, or it could blend in well. Oh, indeed. And I think what we want above all things to do is to fit our students out as well as possible for the challenges, of, as you've been pointing out through this conversation of ours, for mm -hmm. integrating knowledge, for figuring out how to fit pieces together and ask questions about 
what this all means. What's if you try to think the whole thing all at once, all yeah. of the things we're capable of doing, yeah. and ask yourself, what are the things that we should be doing? Yeah. I think that's the kind of integrative knowledge we hope to achieve through an honors education. And, and I think it's a thing that we ought to be aware of, uh, that it's a unique capability available to us now that simply could not have been available to any previous generation. It's at this particular time of qualitative transformation is in the offing, it seems to me. And um, do, do you understand? It, it's not just a quantity, it's not just the French Revolution or a tax cut or a political part. It's a qualitative transformation that's being, we're, we're part of. And we're, there's an old Chinese curse or, or blessing, uh, save us from living in interesting times. <laughs> Because interesting exactly. times are very challenging and very upsetting, but it's also, yeah, and we live in the most interesting time. I suppose people thought that all down through history, but it's a little hard to think that we li may live in the defining generation. Isaac Asimov, we did a program with him once. He said, this is the defining generation. This generation, I don't know, this 100-year period or something, uh, in an evolutionary sense, and realizing that is part of the challenge of uh, people who are able to measure up to where we may have an opportunity to liberate the whole of the whole society in a way that just hasn't been available to us historically, as well as this terrible God of Ramadan that is the offering that we were born into as a little older, uh, that the destructive capability, that we might have a liberating capability where everybody can participate on their own terms in their own way in a, in a liberating context that we were privileged to be born into, possibly. I don't know. It's just a thought. Well, I'll tell you, one thing I find comforting mm. uh, is going back to my roots as a Victorian scholar, yes. 19th century British literature, yes. is you can find something like these statements that we have just been discussing about the future and the quantity of new knowledge and new experience comes yeah. pressing on us. Yeah. You can find something like that existing at least back to the Industrial Revolution. So okay. yeah. what I find comforting about that yeah. is the thought that humans have been confronting this notion that there is so much coming at me, I cannot imagine how to put all the pieces together. <laughs> yes. been in that situation for quite a while now. Yeah, right, so, right, right. Um, so it's not just me yeah. uh, finds it hard to think. And I think that's where we begin to feel a certain fellowship with those that have come before and a certain amount of comfort. I, I'm not saying that the anxiety goes away. It shouldn't yeah. go. Mm -hmm. We should always be challenging ourselves to try and ask these questions mm -hmm. about integrating knowledge. Yeah. But it's at least comforting to know that I'm not the first one who's felt like this. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. We're not alone in that. Thank you for that. And thanks for the program. And thanks for all the good look, work, Jerry. And all the best to people at Wayne State University. Let's by all means stay in touch. And thanks a lot for participating. Thank you once again for all the good work. It was a pleasure to be with you, Harold, and I thank you for those kind words. And it's, as I said, it's always good to work with an alum at Wayne State University. All right. Well, I'm happy to be one. Thank you very much. Thank you for viewing. Thank you, we're, sir. We're, and in the audience, we'll be coming back again tomorrow. Thank you for viewing. And thanks once more, Jerry. Thanks very much indeed. You're most welcome.